subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. The Print of the Cuff presented by IIFL Wealth and Asset Management, Corporate Partner, AU Small Finance Bank, in association with Global Insurance Brokers, Airline Partner SpiceJet, in alliance with Indraprastha Apollo Hospitals and in association with Jindal Steel and Power Limited. I am so happy to welcome you to what happens to be only the second physical edition of Off the Cuff since March. And I am happier still that our guest today is Ambassador Ken Jester, the US Ambassador to India, uh, who's just done almost three and a half years of tenure in India and a very eventful one. So Ambassador Jester, uh, tell us a little bit about the dull moments you've had in these three and a half years. Well, before we start, Shaker, I do want to say that I woke up this morning to the very sad news of what was going on in Washington, D.C. And while it's fine in democracies to protest, there's no place whatsoever for rioting and lawlessness. And it was a very horrific scene to see the storming of the U.S. Capitol. And this is not something that should ever take place in a democracy. And it's something that I was not America at its best, but we will recover and move on. So I want yeah, because to protest doesn't mean that you storm uh, the exactly. Parliament Hall. Exactly. Exactly. It has to be peaceful. And we allow that of any concern in our country, but when it gets to be violent, it's unacceptable under any standard. Yeah, because, you know, in fact, I was awake uh, and I, I tweeted twice and I said that this is a very bad example for democracies with where institutions may not be so strong. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we do have strong institutions. And as I say, we will recover and bounce back. But it was a sad scene this morning to wake up to. And also, I think I also said a little bit of a uh, sort of, um, if I may say so slightly, root comment that Xi Jinping and uh, Kim Jong-un and Putin must be having a hearty laugh. That's yeah, it's, it's quite possible. Yeah. So what have been the dull moments? Yes, what have been your dull moments? You know, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to be the U.S. Ambassador to India. And it's a relationship in a country where there aren't dull moments. It's a around-the-clock job. I've loved it in every respect. And I can think of many exciting moments, but I really can't think of dull moments. Dull uh, moments. Oh. That's, the, that's the, I asked you the most challenging question to begin with. Okay. <laughs> if I thought about it some more, maybe I'd come up with something. <laughs> but it really, it's a relationship that covers the scope of human endeavor. We deal with every issue, whether it's defense, counterterrorism, nonproliferation, energy, the environment, trade, investment, education, agriculture, health science and technology, space, the oceans, and so much more. So there's more than enough to keep so one busy. Let me ask you a question that uh, anchors usually ask corporate tycoons after the budget. Where do you rate your, the change during your tenure or during the Trump years on a scale of 10? Where were we when Trump administration began and generally your tenure began and where are we now? Well. Let me not get into the number game, but let me just give you a more descriptive answer. I've been fortunate to work on the U.S.-India relationship for 20 years now uh, in various capacities as Under Secretary of Commerce, uh, as a technology executive in the uh, investment world, and now as ambassador. And the relationship has steadily expanded and deepened and uh, improved. And so I was taking over a relationship that was in good shape, but we came in with a lot of ambition, and I think, uh, candidly, we were able to achieve a great deal as well. So I like to feel that it was in good shape, but we have elevated it and strengthened it and deepened it and uh, left a good relationship for our successors to take on. And each U.S. administration in recent years has built on the success of its predecessors, and it's been bipartisan in your country and in our country. It's been across political parties. In fact, the interesting thing is, uh, as we noticed when you uh, took me with the display of pictures on the walls, that for the past 20 years, this relationship has just been in overdrive. Yeah. And I, completely bipartisan. 
I remember when George W. Bush said, it does not make sense that the world's oldest democracy and the world's largest democracy don't have a more expansive uh, relationship. And he was determined to try to transform that, building on uh, the visit at the end of President Clinton's term by him, and really starting to change that uh, dynamic. And I was fortunate to be involved in that at the outset. And if you look at where we were then and where we are today, it's extraordinary. I'm not sure anyone would have thought we would be this close and uh, be involved this extensively in all issues. So let me present to you three persistent problems or three pers persistent challenges in India-US relationship as I see them. One is trade. Uh, second, and this is more from the American point of view, second, uh, India's dilemma of where does strategic autonomy end and where does a new strategic alliance begin. So challenge of balancing the two. And the third is just the memories and the wounds and the scars of the Cold War and some, uh, some remnants of the Cold War, say India-Russia defense relationship for example, uh, the issues between India and Pakistan, these are all remnants of the Cold War in some ways. So these are the three big, uh, and third, sorry, and the third most important today, or maybe in the last administration, it was trade. Yeah, so let me begin with trade. Uh, any relationship as it grows and expands and deals with more issues is going to have issues on which they disagree. That's inevitable. And there are, from time to time, frictions in the trade area. But again, when I began as Under Secretary of Commerce, our bilateral trade was $18.7 billion. Last year it was $146.1 billion. We are now the largest trading partner of India. In fact, left China behind now. Yeah, and so one of my colleagues used to say, it's never been better. Uh, and the fact is, he's correct. I look to what the potential could be, given the size of our economies, and think that we can do better. And yes, we will disagree on matters, but I would love to see the same ambition applied to the trade area that we have applied in recent years to the diplomatic and defense arenas. And I've put out the idea of really doing a comprehensive free trade agreement that, from India's perspective, would lock in the benefits of market access to its largest trading partner. So it is a potential area of friction but it's also an area of tremendous success. I travel all over this country and see U.S. companies and many Indians deal in the United States. And in fact, Indian companies are investing more in the United States and we're your largest investor here. So it has to be put in perspective. There is huge potential, but it also is a positive story. Yeah, and the other two factors? Uh, you talked about strategic autonomy. Strategic autonomy, autonomy. Strategic strategic autonomy is an Indian uh, concept. And uh, I understand the desire to preserve as many options as possible and to have an independence of action. Uh, and I think this is a question for India. Uh, as you face increasingly some of the threats in your neighborhood, do you need to just to make your defense forces more efficient in terms of interoperability, in terms of the ability of equipment to be synced together, do you need to work more closely with a smaller group or a closer circle of trusted, like-minded partners? We understand that you have procured the majority of your equipment from the Soviet Union and Russia over the years, and it's simply a practical question as technology becomes more sophisticated and as uh, people are worried about the ability of software of one piece of equipment to interact with the software of another piece of equipment, will there be natural limitations on how sophisticated the technology can be from a particular country? But this is a choice for India. They have to balance their desire to have a diverse group of suppliers with getting the most sophisticated technology with getting interoperability and the highest level of efficiency. 
And those are decisions that I think we're going to have so, to so address in the future. It's a dilemma you've defined very well. How to resolve it? The dilemma is, as we sit in Delhi, uh, New Delhi, the dilemma is that I am committed to my strategic autonomy, but I am also committed to a new natural strategic alliance, or a new strategic alliance which I call natural. So how do you... I think, I think it's a question of how you express your strategic autonomy. I understand strategic autonomy is to be India wants to have independence of action and to be free from the coercion of any other country. You can do that in a variety of different ways. And so that then gets to the trade-offs you make to preserve or express your strategic autonomy in the evolving environment that you're facing in the international uh, arena. And as I said, I think as challenges uh, grow in certain areas, you may find that you have to make adjustments to the expression of strategic autonomy while still keeping your independence and not feeling that you're subservient to any one country. And the third, third postulate that there is trouble, that there is, there are tensions with leftover issues of the Cold War? Well, you know, America... And mindsets. Yeah. yeah. This may be generational. It may change as younger people uh, take more positions of power, as people who've been educated in the United States have a different view of it than people who dealt with the United States during the Cold War. Uh, our country is often able to pivot and look forward more easily than others because we don't have as long a history and we don't perhaps view things always in that same perspective. I look at Vietnam. Vietnam we had a war with and yet we're very close together today in terms of how we work together. So it is a mindset but I would like to think that people can look forward rather than uh, uh, be overly obsessive about what might have happened in the past. What's been your biggest challenge? I don't want, I prefer not to use the word frustration, but what's been your biggest challenge where you thought this really should be moving? Well, I think one area that when I came into office, I was determined to try to make, pro make substantial progress on were these pivotal defense agreements that we have been negotiating with India for many years. I was at a uh, track two dialogue, and I think someone said some of these have been negotiated for 10 years. This is yes, before I became fact, ambassador. Fact, some for longer, yes. Yes. And again, it seemed to me these make sense. And somehow are we not communicating the purpose behind these? This is not an effort to control or subordinate another country. And I remember we went to, uh, with the defense minister at the time, Minister Sitaraman, to the uh, indo paycom headquarters in Hawaii and showed her some of the capabilities one could acquire if they signed a Comcasa agreement, secure communications or other types of agreements. And I think people started to understand the benefits of them. And we've now concluded at each of the two plus two ministerials three pivotal defense agreements and they have elevated the defense partnership to an entirely new level. And I think my Indian colleagues truly appreciate the utility of them and have seen it in action and are very anxious to negotiate supplements to them. That's right. So when you say uh, they've seen this in action, the benefits in action, uh, I presume that we are referring particularly to the situation that arose April onwards in Ladakh with the Chinese. Yeah, again, every journalist in India has asked me about what we are doing with India on China. That's not for me to discuss whether we're doing anything, or if so, what it is. That's an issue for the government of India, if they so choose to talk about. Yeah, but I, I understand that. Uh, I'm also not interrogating you. Uh, what I want to know is that how substantive has this cooperation been, uh, say for the Indian policymaker or the Indian strate strategists? How much value do you think has this brought? How much value do they put to this? Again, I'm not trying to be difficult, but I think, I think India greatly values its defense and other relationship with the United States. I think we've made clear that we always want to be supportive of India. 
that we ascribe to the same principles for the Indo-Pacific region in terms of it being free and open and not subject to intimidation, to ensuring territorial integrity and sovereignty. And beyond that, you'll have to extrapolate. But uh, I think, uh, as I said, we have a very positive relationship. So you have your own analysis. Why did the Chinese do what they did? I mean, why? What do they want to achieve? And also the timing. I think this has been a bit of a mystery to everyone because there's been no explicit statement as to what the objective was, uh, whether it was something that grew out of a particular on-site episode and then mushroomed beyond that. Uh, it, it did uh, occur at the same time there were disruptions in the South China Sea, in the East China Sea. Uh, there were claims for the territory of Eastern Bhutan. Uh, and it is troubling because it That's wasn't... Like one-fourth of Bhutan. Yeah. Uh, it's troubling because it wasn't a isolated incident, but it occurred across the entire uh, border in the Ladakh area and at a great magnitude in terms of the number of troops and the amount of heavy equipment. And so the fact that this has now gone on for, you know, eight, nine months indicates that this is going to be a long-term challenge and this uh, is not something that was an episodic incident and I think it has deeply affected the levels of trust uh, between the two countries and will continue to affect what develops more broadly in this region. So uh, democracies have changes of government. Uh, does India need to be concerned about the change in Washington in terms of Washington's approach to China? Well, as I've indicated, the view of the importance of the Indian-U.S. relationship has been bipartisan and has uh, continued with changes of administration. And I know the president-elect and the person nominated for Secretary of State uh, are both experienced in issues relating to India and will very much continue, in my view, the uh, trajectory we're on in terms of the U.S.-India relationship. I think also uh, the views of the uh, uh, challenges posed by the rise of China are bipartisan, certainly in the U.S. Congress, and I think that if uh, folks who are coming in have not been as up to date on some of the information and intelligence that will get there, and they will see that this, I think it's across the board, is going to be their major overarching issue. The exact nuances of every element of their policy are going to be up to them, but I think there's no question that the relationship with China and how to manage that is going to be a major preoccupation. They've been around for some time. They've dealt with these issues before. Right. Uh, they are not outsiders who are coming into this. And so many of them will just pick up the thread from where, where they were. But I don't know if they will just pick up the thread because four years have intervened and a lot has occurred during that period of time. And so they won't be unfamiliar with the issue, but they may have a approach that is uh, slightly different than what it was previously. We all adjust to uh, the realities of what we're dealing with. Sometimes that takes a bit of time because you're not sure whether the new information you're perceiving is an aberration from the situation or it's a new pattern that's developing. But I definitely think that they will uh, not be exactly the same as they were when they were last in office. Now, let me ask you a question. Uh, I mean, if you ask me that question, my an I know my answer, but I'm not being interviewed, you're being no. interviewed. Uh, why should the U.S. be taking India so se seriously? Why should it be take giving India the kind of importance that India thinks it deserves. Give me a view of India from Washington. Okay, well I think one of the uh, enduring legacies of this administration will be to have really solidified the concept of the Indo-Pacific, right. which connects India and the Indian Ocean to East Asia and the Pacific, integrates from the west coast of the United States to the east coast of Africa, and puts India in a central position in terms of the broader stability 
and prosperity it's of that region. Ex expression that we haven't heard yet from Biden or his people, Indo-Pacific. Well, I, I would tend to think that this is something that, well, it had been talked about episodically before the, the current administration uh, has really now taken deep roots. Uh, President Trump spoke about it in 2017. Prime Minister Modi spoke about it. ASEAN and ASEAN centrality is part of the Indo-Pacific. I hear the European countries now referring to the Indo-Pacific. And it recognizes the reality of, of international trade and of this region. And India, as a vibrant democracy, is going to be a key player in that. Because as I referred to earlier, you really have to, one of the lessons of the COVID-19 pandemic is that globalization cannot mean doing everything in the most cost efficient way. It means trying to get the benefits of the international system, but also mitigating political risks and taking into account the fact that you don't want to be overly dependent in critical areas on partners you may not be able to trust. But if you're looking for trusted, like-minded partners, India, the United States, Japan, Australia, these are core countries of the Indo-Pacific region. And India is a key player, and a strong and democratic India is in the interests of the United States. And that's why we have supported India's rise on the global stage. And it's in our national security strategy. In strategic studies, they talk about three geos, geology, geography, geostrategy. Uh, India doesn't have that much geology in terms of resources, uh, no oil, to put it simply. Uh, geography, yes, because geography is part of geostrategy. So when you say Indo-Pacific, it is India's location that, is, that matters. Well, it's more than India's location, though. It's the fact that it's a democracy, it's a large economy, it's people who share our interests and, and our values. Uh, it's a partner that we think is important to the overall stability of this region and the international system. You, you, you took away my follow-up question. Okay. <laughs> so thank you very much. Now, China. Uh, will, uh, how much of a shadow will China now cast over the way global relationships and strategic balance develops? Look, I think this is still a uh, unknown question. The principles behind the Indo-Pacific is that it should be an inclusive region, that we want to benefit from everyone's growth. China is integrated in a lot of our economic activities. It's very different than the Cold War situation. Uh, and so how we manage that rise and how China manages that rise will be the great uh, issue uh, for the next five to 10 years. Ideally, it can be in a way that's mutually beneficial. If it starts to be in a way that becomes conflictual, and no one wants a conflict. I don't think the Chinese do. I don't think India does. And I know the United States does not. So we have to figure out how do we manage that rise and the influence that China has in a way that can be beneficial and not detrimental. So staying with this, again coming at it from the Indian point of view. Uh, China is a big power. The US is a big power. Uh, we may laugh at it sometimes, but that's because you can laugh at the U.S., right? It's a democracy. Uh, two big powers can decide to kiss and make up and leave others who are targeted by either of them out in the cold. This concept of a G2 has been floating around right. for a while, but I, it just is not uh, credible in my view. It's not the way things happen in the world. Uh, as I said, the United States and India and other countries want to figure out a way to interact constructively with China if that is possible. But I seriously doubt that anyone thinks that suddenly the United States would abandon all of its relationships and work out a global pact with the Chinese in terms of how to manage the world. It's just not practical in my point of view. And, you know, again, we believe that our interests are in common with other democracies and that's what we want to build on to spread the sort of principles and values that we think matter and that will be beneficial for our people. Have you had many tough conversations with the Indian counterparts? Tough conversations tough, just generally? Tough, maybe bordering on unpleasant. 
Uh, I have not had, not had unpleasant conversations. Uh, India is an incredibly respectful country, and I treat the U.S. ambassador with great well, respect. Unpleasant is in perspective. Okay, but I also, you know, I'm a, I, I believe I'm a straight shooter. I'm candid, I'm open, I'm direct. You know that. Yeah, and uh, I think, I, I like to think that that's appreciated. And so my, you know, this goes back to the evolving relationship with my Indian counterparts. In 2001, it would be a very different conversation than it is in 2020 or 2021. There's now a, a, a level of trust, a comfort level, habits of cooperation that mean when we disagree, we try to figure out what's behind it and whether we can resolve it. As an American diplomat, how do you deal with the, with the twin challenge of a country which ha has closed economy as far as trade is concerned, reasonably closed, uh, or not as, not as open as you'd want to be, and also at the same time not socially as liberal as it used to be, or or is or it is reputed to be. Look, India has its own internal decisions to make on its economy or other uh, policies. We have a stake in having India have a strong economy, both because of our affection for the people of India and because a strong economy underpins what India can do in the region and in the world. It can modernize its military, it provides jobs for its people, and it provides growth and prosperity. So we feel that openness brings about the type of growth and consumer choice and, and jobs that would be most beneficial. We think that's been borne out by the history, not just of India after the 1990 reforms, 1991 reforms, but also in countries in East Asia that increasingly opened their economy. But this is, you know, a choice for India. And, every, and as I said, every, every economy is, or country is trying to say, with the COVID-19 pandemic, how do we adjust? And if self-reliance is meant to say we need to be more resilient, more secure, uh, more competitive, that makes sense. If it leads to a closed economy, that's a choice for India. We think opening is not a concession to us, it's something that would be in their own interest, but that's going to be up to them. And on the social side, have you seen changes in the last four years? You know, again, India is a vibrant democracy, an incredibly diverse country. It's really many countries rolled up into one. You travel around the country, you meet people of all different types and religions. Uh, there's a, you know, more newspapers in New Delhi, than, you know, half the east coast of the United States. Uh, and so, yeah, there are issues that uh, get uh, attention that uh, may be troubling, and there are other things that make it a very vibrant democracy. India holds elections with six to seven hundred million people without a hitch. It's an extraordinary thing. And I say that watching our own. But election. democracies can have their aberrations as we saw last night, last night yeah. Indian time yeah. in Washington. So this democracy can ha also have its aberrations. Yeah. And, and I know that Trump administration was very helpful to Indian government in the Congress, etc. on these issues. Uh, but how concerned would you be uh, about these issues, uh, tolerance, uh, liberalism, uh, India's secular values, uh, how concerned would you be about the shadow this may cast on India-U.S. ties going ahead? Again, we're both democracies, we're both resilient, we have processes to react to things that the public may disagree with. We also have elections that empower certain uh, individuals. As I've said, diversity is a strength for both of our countries. Uh, it's really what contributes a lot to our, our, our successes. And uh, India has the motto, unity in diversity. And the United States says, e pluribus unum, out of many one. And we both benefit from the contributions of diverse people to our societies. And quite frankly, it's what gives us, I think, some of our status in the world and is one of the strengths of our relationship. So if in either country, because neither are perfect, we get out of kilter in that, that will have an impact. But hopefully, just as I, you saw in the United States, if something happens that is uh, regrettable, it gets, uh, gets corrected. Yeah. Uh, I have a bunch of questions from my colleagues. 
So what I'll do is I'll take a question from my youngest colleague in this list. Because okay. all the others are usual suspects who you know. The others have a mindset that's in the But, but they're right? usual suspects that you know. So, okay. so this is a young, uh, a young woman called Pia Krishnan Kutti. And she, she's read your op-ed in the Times of India. And she says, you talk, <laughs> you've talked about diplomatic coordination among US, India, Australia, Japan, and how India is a critical partner in maintaining peace in the Indo-Pacific. Now she says, what spe steps do you think US should take going ahead in 2021 to strengthen the Quad? Well, I think it would be helpful if we continued it on annual ministerials, we may even ultimately have a Quad summit. Uh, and we continue to build organically the agenda of issues we work on. We focus on maritime security, on pandemic management, on uh, cybersecurity, on humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, which is really how the Quad got formed initially, uh, and uh, on regional connectivity, which is very important. And we simply have to continue as the members of the Quad are comfortable building the types of things we can do together and also be flexible to work with other like-minded countries in the region, either as a quad or as some subset of the quad. What we want to be doing over the next five to 10 years is building out the architecture further of the Indo-Pacific region to give form and substance to the principles we've espoused. And that's what part of this process is. Because if you read uh, President-elect Biden's article earlier article in Foreign Affairs. There is nothing there, uh, it doesn't specifically refer to Indo-Pacific in these terms, but there's nothing there that should worry India. Because he's also talking about building a, an alliance of democracies and like-minded countries to counter China. So that seems to be quite a bit of bipartisanship there. Yeah, again, I don't know that he would add that last part about the counter China. I think what we want to be doing is building something positive yeah. uh, to the degree Others want to participate in that. That's certainly uh, possible. But we've enunciated a vision for this region. We've enunciated a set of principles that it's free, it's open, freedom of overflight, freedom of navigation, that it's disputes are resolved peacefully, that there's no predatory financing. Now we've got to put in place some of the mechanics to give meaning to those principles and to ensure that that's the type of region that develops and that we don't wake up one day and have a very different region. And that will involve establishing guidelines, standards, and maybe even if necessary, red lines. So what kind of mind space uh, did Pakistan occupy during your tenure? Have we truly dehyphenated or not? Well, I think it's dehyphenated in the United States. I think this administration and this president uh, was the first one to really, in a very strong way, call out cross-border terrorism as unacceptable as any other form of terrorism and to suspend military assistance uh, as a consequence. And our view is that we want everyone in this region to try to promote peace and prosperity and not to uh, in any way uh, uh, give comfort to those who might be involved in cross-border so, terrorism. So Pakistan did not paint big time on your radar screen while you well, were Well, in I mean, I interacted with the Pakistani High Commissioner here. I interacted with our embassies in Pakistan. We would compare notes. Obviously, after the terrible incident in Palwama, we talked because we wanted to make sure that we all understood what was uh, going on and, and, and try to ensure that there would not be any further escalation uh, of uh, the situation, but it has not been a daily preoccupation of my position. But that's a big change from yeah. the past. Yeah. Uh, because I've had people in this room tell me that, look, we want you to be, you tell us that you are a big power, you're an aspiring big power, but then every time we come, you tell us about two more guys from lashkar e taiba who came from this area. So that, there's been less of that now. There's been less of that. Obviously, after a terrorist incident, some of that pops up. But I think the focus in the more recent months has been on the northern border. So once again, a question from one of my young colleagues. So maybe you will answer that one. Uh, 
and be less diplomatic okay. uh, than, than you were when I asked you. So this is Carvey Grewal who says, at your favorite address, you confirm, our people, young people do their homework, unlike yes. us. Yes. Uh, she says, at your favorite address, you confirm the US had cooperated with India to counter aggressive Chinese actions. Aggressive, chi aggressive is in quotes, Chinese actions at the LOC. What was the extent of this cooperation? Again, I really don't, uh, I, I may over time not be fully consistent in my answers, but certainly in the course of a half hour discussion, <laughs> I will be well, that. I'm not going to get into details. Well, we know details that, we of, know of that a we, bunch of clothing was bought uh, or acquired, and that was part of the Lemoa arrangement. That's been reported. Uh, but besides that, we also understand there must be intelligence sharing sharing of uh, electronic resources, but was there any hardware transfers? Shaker, you're a good lawyer. Those are called leading questions. I really do not want to get into what are internal discussions between our two governments, and if the government of India chooses to elaborate on these issues, that's their prerogative, but that's not uh, my role here as ambassador. That's an, Sorry. In, in my business, it's called curiosity. Yes, I right? understand. Uh, it's called if, persistence. If I was a tax man, it'll be right. called fishing expedition, yeah. right? But I'm not a tax man. Now, I, look, I appreciate it. I applaud the diligence on your part and on your younger colleagues, but that's, that's where I am. But let's look ahead. One thing that we saw over the past four years is that Trump administration never talked publicly about India's internal issues. Uh, troublesome internal issues. Do you expect that to continue or will that change? Because President-elect Biden has said things in the past. Yeah, sometimes when you're in, in power, you adjust what you do. I certainly think as an ambassador, uh, you're best discussing disagreements, and they may be disagreements India has with the United States or vice versa, privately. Uh, once you discuss things publicly, you put constraints on the action that can be taken, in my opinion, to deal with the issue. So if you have concerns, it's best to discuss them privately, and that's what So that's the principle of not let, letting disagreements become controversies or disagreements becoming disputes. It's not only not letting them become disputes, I also think it works against, whether, whatever the disagreement may be, works against actually resolving the issue because it tends to force parties to harden positions, to defend things publicly, it changes the dynamics. So on any issue that you may have a disagreement, if you're trying to resolve it, I think it's best to try to do it quietly. I think those out of government, then, you know, that's what they're doing, they're making a living by criticizing and speaking publicly, and that's their prerogative. But when you're in government, you want to ultimately achieve your objectives. You know, making a statement that you feel good about doesn't achieve the objective you want to accomplish. And to achieve the objective, I think you're better off doing it uh, person to person rather than broadcasting. And again, that cuts across any type of issue. So having watched all your predecessors in the past 40 years in this city, uh, am I, I think I'm right to say that you've been the quietest ambassador. Uh, have you done any more interviews before this, one on one? I've done a few interviews, uh, but I have not seen my role as being a public uh, spokesperson. You know, I'm fortunate that I came to this relationship knowing many, if not most, of the key players yes, and people knowing yes. me, and that the United States did have a very solid and strong relationship. Often, I think, ambassadors do a lot of public relations work if they're trying to establish themselves or the relationship or to change something. I was fortunate that I had a lot of that groundwork already done, and so I didn't feel that it was necessary, and again, I didn't necessarily feel it would even be productive. Uh, and I don't think it's hurt my ability to uh, be uh, successful here and productive, and as I have indicated, I think the, the whole relationship has greatly grown and expanded over time, but the last four years have really been a period of ambition and achievement. So now that you're speaking a little bit, you've seen the response from the Chinese embassy here. Yes. Yeah. Again, that's uh, their prerogative to object to things. They've been objecting to a lot of things lately yeah. that they've seen. I'm not sure it was going to have any particular impact on uh, 
what is actually done, and it almost seemed pro forma. Right, right. I think the reaction was sharper, if anything, when Secretary of State Pompeo was here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, before I let you go, two points. One, don't tell me the classified stuff that you will leave behind, but tell me what you can say in public in terms of the advice you will have for your successor. And second, do you have a message for people of India, your friends, as you leave? Now that you have announced yes. that you'll be leaving. Yes. Well, it's always uh, dangerous to give too much advice to your successor, but I would really say that we have a full agenda of issues, and by definition, some of those will not move as quickly as others, and at times you may feel some frustrations or difficulty, but keep working at it, be persistent, uh, and uh, I think ultimately you'll be able to resolve things. And I, the other piece of advice, really, that Foreign Secretary, then Foreign Secretary Jay Shankar gave me, and he's a good friend when I first came as ambassador, is get outside of Delhi, travel this country. I know COVID may present some challenges, but hopefully that will but uh, I noticed last week you were in Kaziranga in Assam. Yes. COVID hasn't stopped yeah, you that no, much yet. Absolutely. Get out. Because it's a tremendously diverse country and you meet people of all types, not just the political and the business, religious, but students, entrepreneurs, factory workers, farmers, and you will feel the vibrancy of this country. You will understand it better and uh, it will really improve your ability when you deal with issues here whether it's the farmer's strike, whether it's something else, to have a broader perspective on it. So get out and uh, see the country and enjoy the country. Uh, in our case, the U.S. has interests in many parts of the country, but it's, a, it's the most fascinating so country. Kaziranga, did you also notice that the rhinos actually like to pose for the camera? Yes, in fact, I also went to the facility where they take rhinos that have had a problem and they develop them, so there were some baby rhinos that would come right up to you and you could uh, feed milk to. Yeah. They're big animals, yeah, they uh, think but it's photo a tremendous... Photo photogenic. Yes, and, uh, tremendous part. And, and something, some thought you would like to leave behind, even for your counterparts in India. Yeah. And I hope I don't get emotional in saying this, but it's, it's, a, not, it's a very special country. And they treat the U.S. ambassador and the representative of the United States in an incredible way, uh, with, with respect, with kindness, with tremendous generosity and warmth. And uh, it really is a reflection of how this relationship has grown, how it's affected people, and how we've all benefited from it. And uh, I, I, I don't think there's any more privileged U.S. ambassador than the U.S. ambassador to India. And so I would tell him it's a unique opportunity and enjoy it to the fullest. And finally, the word you will have for the new administration on how to deal with India. Again, that I think India uh, is a tremendous opportunity for further growth. There are many things we can still do together even further than we have uh, and uh, see it as a uh, growth opportunity that you put resources on. You know, one of the challenges sometimes when you uh, come into office, you're inundated with a whole range of issues. Make sure you keep your eye on the ball in the U.S.-Indian relationship and its importance to the Indo-Pacific and the world at large. So as we close, sort of philosophical question, because you've seen corporate life, you've seen political life, you've seen diplomatic life. How, how much does personal chemistry between leaders, CEOs, investors, investees, how much does personal chemistry matter? I think personal chemistry always matters in everything you do. Countries are made up of people. If you have relationships, you can pick up the phone, you can speak to them, you've done something that engenders goodwill, all of that counts. So always, I mean, I do it because I enjoy the people, but part of your job as a diplomat and even as a senior you know, political official is to invest in personal relationships because you will face challenges down the road that you don't even know exist today. And if you have that relationship, that chemistry, that trust, that trust and respect, 
you'll be much better suited and how to did this them. how did this work between president trump and prime minister modi because the two you couldn't find two persons who are culturally socially politically temperamentally so different well it, it evolved and i give a lot of credit to prime minister modi who's a person of tremendous charisma and uh, very personable and i remember the initial time he came to the White House in June of 2017, he sort of grasped the president and he exuded warmth and that was appreciated and uh, uh, inviting him to the Howdy Modi event in Houston with 50,000 people only set the stage for the Namaste Trump event in Ahmedabad with over 100,000 people. There was no, no event in the world like that in my experience. Uh, the streets were aligned with people for miles, thousands of people all cheering and it was you could feel it was a genuine warmth and then stopping at the gandhi ashram uh and appreciating the history of that place then going to the stadium in Ahmedabad with over a hundred thousand we, we may not see a hundred thousand people in the stadium in, for a while yes is there anything you might remember from those those exchanges again by the way they were very frank in other words there are issues that we're talking about that were discussed in private they were not superficial uh, meetings. Uh, you know, when we were here, we were at Hyderabad, Hyderabad House for several hours, including lunch, and everything came up. And all the troubling points that you talk about, we talk about. Uh, and they, but it's done in a respectful, respectful way. And candidly. Yeah. So that is the test of a good relationship. Absolutely. I think being a candid uh, straight shooter is uh, very important. Well, Ambassador, thank you very much. You've been very generous with your time. And I wish I could have got a bit more out of you on China, but maybe in the course of time. Uh, thank you very okay. much and all the very best to you thank for you. your next innings. That is an expression that you Americans also know just know. as much as we do. Exactly. Uh, we do it with baseball. You do yes. it with another sport. And I do hope that you don't give up your India connection. I would very much look forward to coming back to the country in a different carnation. Their incarnation, but uh, uh, interacting with my many friends here uh, and keeping up with them. And if you come to the United States, I would extend the same well, hospitality. Absolutely. And you know that you have friends in this country. Yes. Thank you very much. You've had a wonderful tenure, Thank wonderful, you. eventful tenure. And maybe we have to, you, you are very careful, so maybe we have to wait for your memoir when it's written. Okay, you need to put something other than water in this process. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate thank it. You. You've been a good uh, colleague. I thank you. Thank you.